I used to sabotage any opportunity to potentially make more money than my mum. So my mum is a nurse. So when I started sharing my sobriety story and I started realizing that I'm actually very good at what I do in terms of speaking, in terms of supporting people, I'm a very curious person and I do have a powerful story, a powerful story that allows me to reach so many different types of people. So it gained a lot of traction quite early on in 2016, 2017. So I would start getting speaking opportunities. In the beginning, everything was sort of free and I was okay with that. Never had to negotiate things around money. Money was not something that was spoken about in my family growing up. I don't know what it was like for you, but the only time that money conversations were really had um, was through arguments. You would only hear money spoken about where there wasn't enough money, etc., etc., etc. So I always had so many different money stories. Money is very hard to come by. Money doesn't grow on trees. You have to work hard for money. Um, So many ideas about rich people. Rich people are bad. Rich people are this. And no one in my family explicitly said that, but I think culturally it was sort of just a thing. People don't have to explicitly say it. Culturally, we all know what the stories are. So when I would hear or get emails saying, Africa, we'd love for you to speak of this thing. It's just half an hour. What is your rate? We're offering 3K. Um, I would just experience so much discomfort knowing that my mum is working so many hours as a nurse on her feet and she's probably making half of that or just about that. So what I would do, and this was not a conscious thing until I started looking at my money story, I would let those emails sit. Any email that was saying I would be getting paid, I would let those emails sit until it was too late. They've probably offered someone else because I just felt so uncomfortable making money so easily. So I would sabotage any opportunity to get paid. But if it was free, I will reply straight away. I'll do it. But when you're in business, that doesn't fucking work. It doesn't work. But even outside of that, I I was shown that because I was incapable of receiving when it came to money, I was incapable of receiving in so many areas. I was incapable of receiving love fully because when I did, I would shut down because a part of me thinks I don't deserve it. I was incapable of receiving opportunities because I'd feel like this has happened way too easily. I'm supposed to, it's supposed to be hard, but this is so easy. So I would be suspicious of it and sabotage it. So those are the two main areas that I've really had to do some work on over the past years. On the first point, Mm -hmm. um, you were very much preaching to the choir there, as I've talked about quite a few times on this podcast. Why do I see relationships as like a bird trapped in a cage or or someone trapped in jail? Well, I go, well, that's what my father was. My father was trapped. My father, my whole life, I, I was convinced he was trapped. That was my first model of what a romantic relationship was. So of course it was the most, um, most evidence backed yeah and so you gotta it's similar to what we were talking about earlier about like stepping into a new story yes and although every part of your being is going this is bad you gotta stay you You, do communicate with in this case the person say by the way this this happens so yes i struggle yes um and hopefully build new evidence and the right person can help you build new evidence i agree which is what my girlfriend helped me to do she helped me to build Without, by just being herself and not being a prison guard, (laughs) she created new evidence and that new evidence is strong. It's not, the old evidence is still there. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think the old evidence will ever go. Oh, I love that you say that, Stephen. I really do. Because I think it's, again, this idea that it has to go completely before we step into the other one. And I think that's what holds people back from fully stepping into their new identity because they think if I'm really supposed to be here and this is actually real and I have all of this new evidence, that's not supposed to be there at all. And I think, again, those multiple truths, they can coexist. It's just what you choose to feed over and over again. Yeah. And if you think of spiders, like, I'm not scared of spiders, but there's a part of me that goes, (laughs) do you know what I mean? (laughs) There's, there's a lot of evidence because I've seen other yes. people running away from them. I've seen films. Yes. But I'm not, I, I know it like objectively, I've got enough evidence to say that the spiders, they don't even bite. Yes. You know, no one's dying of spiders really. But I'm still, there's still a little bit of evidence that I said, be careful, there. you know? And I can exist with those two truths as you, as you describe it. Mm-hmm. You're totally right though, in the sense that people expect them, that they will get to a place where they are healed and cured completely. Yeah. 
And I, I just have never seen it. Me neither. Me neither. I've never seen it. Ever. And I think we have a current culture, actually. So I'm a... I'm a coach and consultant and speaker, et cetera, who's in the realm of self-help, but despises the self-help industry for a multitude of reasons, because I think it perpetuates that idea, that idea of healing as yeah. if it's a destination. Yeah. You know, you sign up for this course, get this book, listen to this podcast, and then it's, it's done, then you're healed. So I think there's a lot of people that are in a very good place if you were to look at it in a very holistic way, but continuously believe that they have to rid themselves of these very human things and this, you know, inevitable human discomfort that we all experience and they put labels on it to make it, you know, mean like it's this. Um, so yeah, I think there's a cult, there is a culture right now where people are on this continuous journey of healing when actually some of these things won't actually go away completely and that's fine that's normal that's an interesting thing because there are some people out there as well i want to get your take on this sure have basically made healing their identity uh-huh it's their personal <laughs> yeah. brand it's their yes. safe space yes. being broken and healing is their it's who yeah. they are and they've embraced that is that harmful and dangerous in your view absolutely i think it is i think it is because it's it again perpetuates another idea which ties into this that we need to be on this pursuit of constantly fixing something, you know? Um, and I think I've also seen people do that in the, as you say it as a brand, but people making it, yeah, making it the actual business, their public persona, this is who I am. And I think it encourages other people or makes other people feel that they need to do the same thing or that they need to sort of make their pain, their identity as well. You also see this with people um, who are contrarian just for the sake of yeah. being contrarian, right? Yeah. I think that's why you... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They just have to disagree then they with everything. They just have to disagree no with... No, no <laughs> new And they usually... That's why when I talk about, um, you know, this kind of seemingly a battle between the woke versus anti-woke, I always see that essentially they're quite the same they're exactly the same you will have the people that are for example anti-woke want to be contrarian for the sake of it you know screaming about how woke everyone has got if people are let's say talking about being inclusive they'll just label that as woke it's the exact same behavior as they claim to oppose which i find very interesting how people can be so loud about something and be so convicted and be wanting to point out a specific type of behavior, not realizing that they're behaving in the exact same way. But I think it is part of that performance where people are being rewarded because they're performing in a very specific way. And they see that, okay, if I perform in this way, I'm going to get likes, I'm going to get opportunities. I get to, to sort of feel, it really feeds the ego as well when you have your echo chamber and you have people that say yes to everything. You have people that see you as some sort of um, leader, but I think it's building some very interesting characters online, especially.